Uh, Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. We, we, we were doing a, we've been doing a bit of a series on faith in the lead up to the floods and everything like that. So we'll, we'll kind of pick that up perhaps a little bit later, but, but this kind of ties in a little bit. But um, I, I just had a, 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 a word on my heart, I guess, that I want to share that I hope is an encouragement to you. I hope that nobody takes this as a negative. It's actually an encouragement. Um, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 35 to 36, it says this. It says, so do not throw away your confidence. Everyone say confidence. Confidence. Do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. Okay? Don't throw away your confidence. Don't throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. Amen? It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere... So that when you have done the will of God, right, you need to persevere so that when you've done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. You will receive what he's promised. There's a lot in those two verses. To give you a little bit of a background, nobody knows who wrote Hebrews. There's a lot of speculation in the Apostle Paul, some other person. There's no clear-cut answer to who wrote this ancient document that we today have wrapped up in this Bible with the, the 66 other um, ancient documents that, that we call a Bible today, uh, biggest selling book of all time. But that document in its original form, nobody actually knows who wrote it originally. What we do know is that it was written to a group of people that had come out of a Hebrew background and the Judaic traditions and all that stuff and had turned to faith in Jesus. They had put their faith in the fact that all these things we did under the old covenant, the sacrifices and all these things, that that none of those things were ever going to make us right with God. The final sacrifice ever made in human history to make anybody right with God was the sacrifice of Jesus. And if you're doing any sacrifices in your own life because you feel like they're going to win you brownie points with God and make you right with God, you're missing the point of the cross. It was the one final sacrifice. There's nothing you can do that's going to make you righter with God than bowing in submission to the cross and accepting that that then Jesus died 2,000 years ago. It was for your sins and my sins. His death wiped away everything that stood between me and God. Amen? Prayer is, for some people, prayer is a sacrifice. It's it's like, if I pray enough, God will like me. No, no, no. God likes you already. He loves you so much he died for you. And it's faith in the cross that opens that door to eternal life and reconnection with God, not how much prayer you pray or how many Bible verses you read or how much you memorize. Sometimes we can do these things and they're kind of like uh, sacrifices to try to to get God to like us more. They're sacrifices to try to get us right with God. If I just have a, 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 a... template of a religious life that's really really good, then God will really like me and I'll be right with God. It's nothing to do with that. It's got to do with the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus and us accepting that we're all sinners. Jesus Christ lived a perfect life. He died on the cross so that if we put our faith in him and accept that he died because of what we did, we can be right with God again. And then we go on and we live a, a, a righteous life out of that place of faith, not in order to get saved. We don't live a good life to get saved. We're saved by grace through faith. But the fruit of that, that salvation is that our life is transformed and changed and we begin to live and look a bit more like Jesus. Amen. So these guys had been through that transformational process, but what happened was they hit a couple of roadblocks and they were copying some pretty severe persecution for their faith. And so the writer to Hebrews is writing, and what he's doing is is through the whole book, he's comparing the Old Testament and the rituals, and he says, you know, this one was this, but Jesus is that. And the temple was this, but Jesus is that. And the, the, the sacrifice was this, but Jesus was that. And he keeps comparing, and he keeps saying that Jesus is greater than Moses, Jesus is greater than Melchizedek, Jesus is greater than, greater than, greater. Keeps pointing, he's trying to point them back to Jesus. Because what they're doing is going, if we, if we throw away our confidence, if we turn our back on this, this thing, this Christian thing, this Jesus story, and go back to the way things were, we won't be copping as much persecution. We can get on with life and have, I guess, a a, a carefree life again to a certain degree because we won't be getting hassled because of the Jesus stuff. And so he's writing to them going, that would be foolish. Don't do it. Don't go back and settle back into your old ways and throw away your confidence, throw away your faith in order to avoid persecution. No, no, no. Persecution, pain, suffering, these are all just part of the journey, amen? 
If there's anybody that can get through from beginning to end, walking with Jesus without facing any of that, I would love you to write a book. I will buy it. I will buy it. I will try anything. But what I've found is that I can't avoid some of the unpleasantness of life. It's just part and parcel of the journey. But he's writing to them and he's saying, don't throw away your confidence. Now that word throw away is a really, really interesting phrase. It's only used twice in the entire New Testament. Now the only other time it's used is in Mark chapter 10. So if you've if you got a Bible there, go with me to Mark chapter 10. I've got to put my glasses on for this one. Mark chapter 10, and we've got the story of a guy called Blind Bartimaeus. Anyone ever heard of Blind Bartimaeus? Yep, yep. He was blind, and his name was Bartimaeus. Hence, the name of the story, Blind Bartimaeus. There you go, deep theological lesson there. And it it starts in verse 46. It says, Then they came to Jericho as uh, as Jesus and his disciples together with a large crowd were leaving the city. It says, A blind man called Bartimaeus was sitting on the roadside and he's begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. I love how crowds operate. Aren't crowds fickle things? It says he, many people rebuked him and told him to be quiet. But he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy. Jesus stopped and said, call him. So the same people who were going, shut up, be quiet, stop calling out to Jesus, suddenly turn around and go, hey, cheer up, get on your feet. He's calling you. Come, come, come. Crowds can be so fickle, can't they? And so it says when the crowd said to come and Jesus called him, it says in verse 50, throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. That's the only other time that this same phrase is used to throw aside. The writer of Hebrews is saying, don't throw away confidence. And here it's a man getting up, he's hearing the call of Jesus. And it says he throws aside his garment, his cloak. Now, back in the day, The cloak that he was wearing was something that was issued by the Roman authorities to validate him as a beggar. So this cloak they're talking about here is not just he was cold and he found a blanket some. No, no, this was one that the Roman authorities issued it to legitimate beggars because there were legitimate beggars back then. And of course, like anyone ever been to India? There are, there are legitimate beggars there, but then there are completely illegitimate beggars who are just trying to make money, scam people, play on, on, on people's sympathies and compassions. They don't need it. They're not using the money for the right reasons, and, and, and they coexist. Well, look, times haven't changed. It's always been like that. And so these guys were given this cloak as a legitimate uh, sign that this guy here is a legitimate beggar. It's okay to give to him. The, the authorities recognise that this guy is a, 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 a beneficiary of begging. It's good for him. Give to him. So, but it says in this situation, even though he had a legitimate right to hang on to that cloak, he threw it away. He had a legitimate reason to hang on to that, but he jumped up and he threw that thing away. Just like these Hebrews. They actually had a legitimate reason to be considering throwing away their faith. The persecution and the pressure and the stuff they were suffering was in, some people would say, well, that's fairly legitimate. Nobody wants to live like that. Why don't you just have a quiet faith? Why don't you just have a secret faith in your heart, but go back and live this way publicly and just have a secret faith and you'll still love Jesus in the secret and the quiet and so on. But but the writer's going, no, don't don't do that. Don't do that. Don't throw that away. You know, there there are legitimate reasons why Bartimaeus could have held on to his cloak, but he chose not to. So he threw, he threw away that which was not of God in order to receive that which was from God. There are many people today, though, that are doing the opposite. They're throwing away legitimate things of God in order to go after illegitimate things. Let me give you some examples, and I just want you to think about this in your own world. And, and I'm saying this because the church has gone through, or the world has gone through, a tough three years. Amen? It's been tough. The world has changed probably more in the last 10 years than it did the 50, 100 years before with ideologies and, and the way we look at things. The church has changed in the last five years, quicker than I've ever seen the church change in terms of our, 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 our theological understandings of things, the, the things that we're saying are okay now that once weren't for hundreds and hundreds of years of orthodox Christianity, uh, the, the, the things that we're saying aren't okay, that it's once upon a time were okay. There's been such a shift and a change uh, happening even in the church space for such a long time that, that I understand why people get tired. I can understand why people in this room would feel tired right now. I, I understand why... Government officials are tired right now. I understand why the medical profession is tired right now. I understand why pastors and leaders are tired right now. 
I, I, I understand uh, why children are tired right now. It, it's just been such a hectic few years. And you know what? There's no point saying it won't continue on. We don't know. We just simply don't know. If there's anything I've worked out in the last three years, it's this. I'm not in control. It doesn't matter what financial plans I have in place. It doesn't matter how well I've dotted my I's and crossed my T's. It doesn't matter. It, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. In the blink of an eye, everything can change. The only thing that, that, that I'm, I'm hoping and praying and believing won't change in my world, that, you know, apart from my marriage, we'll stay married and we'll still have our kids and we'll still... But, but, but my faith in God, I'm, I'm clinging to that. That at the end of the day, even though everything else changes, God doesn't change. He hasn't changed. And here's the thing. God will not be pressured into changing. He will not be pressured into changing. We may be, but God won't be pressured into changing and adapting just because the world says we, we, want, we want a God like this. God doesn't sit there and go, yep, no worries. I'll take some notes. We'll have a board meeting. I'll see if I can tweak a few things, come back to you. But I'm pretty sure we can meet that one. God's not doing that. God's going, I'm sorry. But it's just the way it is. I am that I am. I always have been and always will be. And at the end of the day, see, God, God doesn't exist to serve the church. The church exists to serve God. Amen? He, he's God. And to God goes all the glory and to God goes all the praise and to God goes all the fame and to God. And we're hands and feet and we get about and we do our business. But, you know, somewhere in Christianity, I think in the West in particular, we kind of lost sight of who's the centre of the story. And we've put ourselves in the centre of the story that we're the most, remember that ad years ago? For the most important person in the world, you. Anyone remember that ad? Remember that? Anyone, anyone remember that ad or... A couple of us here, yeah? Most, yeah and, and, and that's kind of what, what the church space can look a little bit like too. That, that, that everything revolves around you and God's just, it's all about you. And, all, and it is because God so loved the world that he gave his only son. That's the truth. And that will never, ever change. But the story needs to be flipped a little bit. It's not just God sitting there wanting to serve the church. He does that and he loves. But, but you know what? We're the ones that bow to him, not the other way around. Humanity bows to God, not, not, not God to humanity. So I understand. I'm, I'm saying all that to say I understand why people are tired. Now, here's what I want to do. I want to throw some things out at you. And I want you just to have a bit of a think. Maybe some of this will sit. Maybe some of it won't. And maybe some of it will just make you think. But I was thinking this morning, this was not what I was going to preach. I came in here to preach something else. But as usually happens, I'm sitting there and all of a sudden my brain goes Whoa, down this way. And I start thinking, oh, God, th- th- this... This guy threw away his cloak, that which he legitimately could have hold, held on to in order to have what you had for him. Although I wonder, how many cloaks have I thrown away, or maybe am throwing away, or maybe thinking about throwing away from the opposite end of the spectrum? These are cloaks that I'm throwing away that are actually things that God has given to me because it's just getting too hard. A bit like the Hebrews who just wanted to, let's just tone our faith down a little bit here, people. Let's just go back in our hearts, but let's just go back and do the rituals and do the form and so on and relieve the pressure and the persecution. So here are some cloaks that, that, that maybe we, we've, we want to examine our own hearts. Have we thrown this away? We can throw away the cloak of prayer because we think it just doesn't work. Anyone ever prayed a prayer that didn't get answered? I, I'm unsure about that. I just don't know whether I've ever prayed a prayer that didn't get answered. I know I've prayed prayers where I didn't get what I wanted. That's 100%. There are prayers I've prayed and said, God, this is what I want, and I never got that. But I don't know that I've prayed a prayer that hasn't been answered. I I don't have a divine perspective of things. Maybe all my prayers have been answered, and maybe sometimes the answer was no. I might not have liked it, and it might not fit my theological paradigm. I might need to see something as evidence that God heard my prayers. Uh, but, but, But... Sometimes we can throw away the cloak of prayer because we just get tired. We just get tired. We've prayed and we've prayed and we've prayed and we've prayed and we just feel like nothing's happening. And so we get tired and it's a legitimate, legitimate thought. I prayed and prayed and nothing happened, so what do I do with the prayer space? Well, for some of us, it's like that cloak. We just, we just throw away the prayer space and we just settle for a life that's prayerless. Maybe occasionally when we get with somebody else, we'll just flick a prayer out there just as a social thing but really prayer is not that important anymore because we're tired and prayer doesn't work so maybe there's someone here and you feel a bit that way you've thrown away that cloak of prayer 
We can throw away the cloak of the word of God. It's just too hard now, God. There's so many people telling me it means this, and then it means that, and it means, oh, it's overwhelming. So many translations, so many perspectives. This group believes that. This, oh, what, how am I supposed to work it out? I'm not a Hebrew and Greek theologian. It's, it's too much. I'm over it. They're changing the meaning of this now, and it used to mean that, and now they're saying it means this, and now, now the people that actually study it, and they're fighting over what it really means, and if they can't work it out, what over we got? What difference does it make? I memorized the verse last week. This week I memorized another one, but then I forgot the one I memorized the week before. What's the point? It's all just going to go in one ear, out the other anyway. It's like talking to your children. God, when you talk to me, it's like talking to your children. Go on. What difference is it making? It's irrelevant. It changes nothing. The Word of God is ancient and outdated. All these things that start to creep in, before you know it, we throw away the cloak of the Word of God. And we don't read it anymore. We've got no time for it. We can throw away the cloak of fellowship. I don't really need all you in my life. I can do this Christian thing on my own. I don't need you guys. I don't need you guys. I just do it by myself. I'll just have my, my, my social sphere is going to be full of people that don't care about God, don't believe in God, because that would make me a great witness, God. I'll be in there being the great witness. I don't need the church people. You're all saved anyway. Why do I want to hang out with you guys? All right. You know, that's been hard for me over my Christian walk because I have an evangelistic bent and I love being with non-believers and it's been, well, it's been through taking a lot of knocks in my life to, to get to the point to realise I actually need you guys. I, I, I need you. I, don't, I, don't, I, it, it, I, 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 I might not want you, <laughs> but I need you. And you need me. And you need each other. There's a reason why. Uh, later on in Hebrews he says, don't forsake the gathering together. Now, I don't want to stand up here and, and, and say that means you all need to come to a church building and a church meeting. That's not, I don't believe that's what he was saying at the time. We look at church today and sometimes we use that verse as a way to, you know, manipulate people to make sure you're here on Sunday. Make sure you're on. It's not about that. The focus is on the fellowship with one another, being with one another. Whether it, and this is a great opportunity to get together on a Sunday morning uh, with a whole bunch of people. This is the only time in the week where I get to actually worship and get caught up with, you know, sometimes I might not feel like worshipping, but I just feel Pauline behind me and Sue getting right into the worship and I get swept up in it. I get reminded again, yeah, hang on, it's not, God is good, you know. And the person next to you is worshipping and you kind of get caught up in that. It's like that, that time when I think it was, was it Paul and Silas were in prison. And it says that at midnight, they began to sing hymns and praise to God. Remember that story in Acts? They began to sing hymns and praise. And as they began to sing hymns and praise, the Bible actually tells us that the prison, there was an earthquake. The prison doors opened and the chains fell off. What's interesting is the doors didn't just open to their cell. It opened to everybody's cell. Chains didn't just fall off them. The chains fell off everybody around them. And that's the power of worship when we get together and we gather together is that, that, that my worship isn't just about me connecting with God. It can have an impact on the people around around me as well. Change can drop off you just from being in the presence of, of people worshipping and focused on God. I believe that with all my heart. I've experienced it in my own life when I've come here kicking stones like a sad sack and don't want to be here. You're the pastor. You've got to be there. I know. Still don't want to. We can throw off the cloak of fellowship. We can throw away the cloak of communion. It's just another ritual that we do. You know, there are some beautiful, beautiful rituals in Christianity that have been part of the fabric of the church for thousands of years. Now, now we're a Pentecostal church, yes, and yep, I'm into, you know, I, we are Pentecostal, and, and sometimes I get accused by people, well, you're not Pentecostal because you don't speak in tongues from the front, and you don't have all the, and it's like, no, 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 we're, we're Pentecostal in the sense that we believe in the power of God, we believe in the day of Pentecost, we believe in the filling of the Spirit, we believe in all that stuff, but we believe if you're born again, you have the Spirit, by the way. If you don't speak in tongues, it's not the, the, the be-all and end-all. If you've given your life to Christ, according to Paul's theology, you have the Spirit anyway. So if there's anybody here wondering what I mean by that, you have the Spirit if you have surrendered your life to Jesus. End of story. End of debate. As far as I'm concerned and as far as Paul teaches. But uh, ha having said that, there are some beautiful rituals, aren't there, throughout church? Anyone ever, ever spoken to a Catholic person about the rosary beads and what they actually mean? Anyone ever done that? Find a Catholic person, go and talk to them about the meaning in the rosary beads. It's just, it's, it's beautiful. Uh, there, there, there are, there are uh, uh, certain rituals and things that raving Pentecostals would go, oh, it's legalistic. It's a... No, no, there's some beauty in some of these things. And com communion is one of those things. We take communion here at Arise every Sunday. And it's not just some rote thing that we do. It's not, it, 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 you know, 
Paul said that Jesus said to do this in remember of us. Every time you do this, you're proclaiming the good news of Jesus. Something happens during communion. I'm not just sitting there uh, picking up this tiny... And it is weird, by the way. If you're a non-church person, I apologise. It's kind of weird. We gave you a thimble of juice, just enough to wet your whistle, but then nothing. And we gave you a, 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 I'm not sure, a wafer. I'll call it a wafer because there's people present. But um, we, we give you one of these things. It's kind of weird, isn't it? But, 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 but it means something to us because it reminds us, a constant reminder of the main thing. We're keeping the main thing the main thing. Jesus Christ crucified, buried and resurrected for our sins so that we could have eternal life, so we could be reconnected with God, so that all the things I've ever done wrong can be wiped clean. That barrier of sin between me and God can be totally removed because of what this man, what Jesus Christ did 2,000 years ago. That's why we do it. We constantly remind ourselves. And so, you know, sometimes we can throw away the cloak of all that stuff and think, well, we don't need all that stuff. It's just another ritual. I don't need it, but we do. We can throw away the cloak of generosity, you know, gets to a point where we go, oh, it's just, it's time to look after number one for a while. You know, the church has enough. I don't need to, 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 to give to the church anymore. Hey, I, I, here's the thing. Some people think that, that, that you give to the church because the church, you know, that it's all about the church needing to keep running. We miss the bigger point behind it. It's gonna, it that, that's a part of it. That's a part of it. But you go in, you look at the teachings of Jesus and what Paul wrote about generosity. It's about generosity. It's about cultivating a generous spirit. That's what it's about. It's not just about uh, paying electricity bills and all that kind of stuff. That's the practical aspect of it. But here's the thing. It's about getting something in our own world where we actually become generous people, where we're prepared to release things to God, not just have control over everything all the time. I, I, I speak to, 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 have spoken to people over the years and they'll tell me, oh, I don't give to the church financially at all. I just, I, I, I just give as the Lord leads. Now, hey, I don't have a problem with that. I believe that it's great. You should give us the Lord leads. But, but what the, the point you're missing is this. You're maintaining 100% control the whole time, aren't you? You're in complete control. I'll just go as the Lord leads. I stay in control of it. You know what? When, I, when I, you know, we passed an app, we haven't always passed it. When I would, 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 would place my money in an offering or my tithe, whatever you want to call it, when I would, would give that to the church, I would give that and I would, it would, I would release control of that. There was something about the releasing of control that begins to break something in your life as well. I've also noticed most people that sit back and go, I just give as the Lord leads. But a lot of those people that I've spoken to, they give very little because it's amazing how the Lord doesn't seem to lead too much. You know? So anyway, that's the message for another time. But sometimes we can throw away the cloak of generosity. Uh, we can throw away the cloak of service to others. We can just not want to serve other people. I don't have time to serve anywhere or any person for that matter. I'm just too busy in my own world. Uh, you know, I know my neighbour's lawn's overgrown, but I'm just too busy. I, I, I can't take any time out and I can't help. Did, did, did your lawn get that, by the way, Rod? Looks pretty good. Awesome. 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 Uh, I, think it, I think it rained again and it got all wet. So, but, um, but just getting out there and serving other people and doing things to help other people. Uh, we, we live in, a, in, a, in an age, it's interesting in Romans, I think it is, Paul writes when he talks about the end times and, and so on. One of the things he says, he says that, that people will become lovers of themselves. People will just become lovers of themselves. We'll just be self-consumed. It'll be all about me. Me, me, me. Yeah, there you go. It's not so much about the God, it's me. And then I'll post it so everyone knows how great I am. Lovers of selves. But, but we can throw away... The cloak of service to others, yet that's something that we're called to do is to serve. And I'm not just talking about serving in a church, picking up a vacuum or making morning tea. I'm not just talking about that's part of it, but service to others is way bigger than that. It's what we do with the rest of our week as well. The, the people know they can call on you and go, hey, if I, if I have a need, a legitimate need or need some help, you're the person I can ring up. Or do they go, oh, I wouldn't ring you, they're always too busy. That, 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 that they wouldn't be able to, that, you know. Sometimes busyness is a badge of honour in our culture and society, isn't it? Oh, I'm just so busy, I'm so busy, it's like a badge of honour. <laughs> Funny. Anyway, again, that's another message. We can throw away the cloak of expectation. I'm not really expecting anything to happen here anymore. Maybe God's taken a rest before the journey back to earth. Maybe God's done enough and he's just sitting there now, packing his bag, getting ready for his return. And we can come along to church and we've got no expectation whatsoever. If I reckon if I did an honesty thing with a beep, 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 one of those type of things around here, every one of us have come to church one Sunday morning and had zero expectation. We just turned up because we knew it was the right thing to do. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's fine. 
But we can lose our sense of expectation about God, not just here. What about just in your world in general? The expectation of, 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 of encountering God, the expectation of God dropping something in your spirit while you're washing the dishes, the expectation of God actually answering that deep, deep question that's inside of your heart that's been sitting there for so long, the expectation that, 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 that David said, I, I would have lost hope in the Psalms. He said, I would have lost hope if I didn't believe I'd see the goodness of God in the land of the living. In other words, this side of heaven, I'm going to experience and see and know God here, this side of heaven. And if I didn't have that, David said, I would have lost heart. And how many people have lost heart, thrown away that cloak of expectation because we just don't expect God to turn up and to do anything anymore? We're going to finish in a second with a, a worship song. We're going to get up. We're going to sing that um, Lord Almighty. I love that song. It's, it's awesome. You guys want to come up? We're nearly done. We're going to sing that song. And, and, and here's the thing. Uh, are we just singing it and, and making sure that we've got our tune right so the person next to us sits next to us next week because if we sound terrible, they might not want to. Or is there some sense of expectation of we can, we can connect with God here? You know, sometimes in worship, I will close my eyes and I don't, I'm not, not feeling anything, but I will, I will picture in my eyes. I'll, I'll just picture God just floating up above me, watching, just looking at me. And I'll just close my eyes and I'll just imagine that it's just me and him alone and he's there. It's just a little picture I put in my head that creates a little sense of expectation. Hey, I'm not just singing a song to fill in a little bit of time because we have our three songs, a verse, communion, you know, coffee and, and go home. But there's a sense of expectation. And then finally, and this is what the writer of Hebrews is saying to the Hebrews. We can throw away the cloak of faith itself. We can just think it's just too hard. It's just too hard, God. It's too difficult to stand firm and proclaim the good news of Jesus. It's just too difficult to plant my feet this side of the fence. You know, God, it's so much easier if I can straddle both sides. It's so much easier if I can be kind of a friend of the world. and a fr- it, It's so much easier. And guess what? You're 100% right. It is. It is 100% right. It is so much easier to have sort of one, one foot over here with God and one over there. It, 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 it's, it's easier to do that where you can be like a chameleon and just change colours and, you know, drift wherever you want and go wherever you want. And it would have been easy for these Hebrew believers just to go, you know, we'll just go back to the ritual, but we'll keep a faith in our heart. And the writer of Hebrews says, don't do it. Don't do it. I know it's tough and I know you're copping it right now, left, right and centre, but don't do it. He says, keep going, even though it's tough, because your story isn't finished yet. Your story's not finished yet. Don't put a full stop where God's got a comma. He's still writing. There's more to come. But you need to persevere. You need to persevere. You need to keep going. He says, so do not throw away your confidence. Do not throw away your faith. Then he makes this claim. He says, it's going to be richly rewarded. That's hard, isn't it? When you're not seeing the coins pop in now, when you're not seeing a little bit of return, it's hard. But he's saying, no, no, no. You need to take this one to the bank. It will be richly rewarded. Your faith, your stance for God, it will pay dividends. It's a guarantee it's going to happen. But he says this. He says, in order for it to be richly rewarded, here's what comes first. You need to persevere so that when you've done the will of God, you'll receive what is promised. I hate that. I hate that phrase. Because what he's saying is this. You need to do the will of God now with no reward in the midst of the tough times. You need to keep doing the will of God and persevere with it before the will of God comes into your world. Before that promise comes, you've got to do the will of God. You've got to be doing the will of God. You've got to make your choices the way God wants you to make them. You've got to walk the way He wants you to walk. You've got to live the way he wants you to live. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, in other words, the doing from my end comes first, then God steps in. Call it anointing, blessing, call it whatever you want. I don't care what you call it. But this is a consistent theme in the word of God. God tells us what we need to do. We do it. Then God comes through. We don't stand back and hear God tell us what to do and how to live. And we go, that's awesome. I'm just going to stand still and do nothing. You come through with your bit first, then I'll get on board. If that was the case, we wouldn't need faith. It'd be irrelevant.
So I don't know. Maybe there's some people here and, and you're tired and you feel like you've thrown away some cloaks. And here's the thing. I'm not being bagging people. You've got a legitimate reason, I'm sure. It's been tough. We've got legitimate reasons. But so did the beggar. He had a legitimate reason to hang on to that cloak. But he went, no, 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 I'm going to throw that away because I believe God's got something better for me. If you're in this place today, let me encourage you. Why don't you make that decision to throw that thing away? Because God's got good things for us, amen? The great sleeping giant of the world is not Russia or China. It's the church. Actually, let me finish with this. I forgot I had this. I came across an article in Christianity Today, written in 1963, I might add. 1963. And here's what the writer said about the church in 1963. He said, the main problem with the contemporary church is not that some are saying God is dead, nor that the redemptive thrust of the gospel has been dulled by the overemphasis on social action, nor even that theologians, ministers and ecumenical organisers are hanging crepe. The problem is that the man in the pew, and I'm, I'm reading the man in the pew to be all of us, myself included. He says, the problem is that the man in the pew has lost interest in doing anything about the main challenges confronting the church today. And if the man in the pew is uninterested, the parish church will die, if it has not already done so. This is written in 1963. If the man in the pew does not exercise his individual Christian responsibility towards others who are not Christians, if he does not give tangible meaning to his asserted belief that he should love his brother as himself, then God will, for all modern intents and purposes, have been killed by the very ones who call themselves his children. Isn't that heavy? In other words, what he's saying in a nutshell, if the church that claimed to have an amazing and awesome God don't outwork that faith in any tangible way, our inability to outwork it communicates to the world that God's not real. And then he finishes with this. Here is the church's weakest link. Those who confess Christ and then do nothing for him. I read those words and I thought, Like so much else in the Word of God, I hate it. But just because I hate it doesn't mean it's not true. So, Father, I want to pray for us this morning. Lord, pray for each of us in this room. God, those of us that, uh, God, we may have recognized ourselves in some of those cloaks, Father. We, we have legitimate reasons and we've thrown things away. But we didn't realize that we were actually throwing away the best of God in some of those things, Lord. Maybe we need to pick up some of those cloaks, some of us, and put them back on. We need to start praying again, reading our Bible, prioritizing time with other believers, conversation about God and what he's saying, what he's doing. But maybe we need to be generous again, Father, not just financially, but with our time. Give time to other people. Show them value by giving them time, Lord. Maybe it's, 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 it's encouragement, Father, giving them value. Father, we are all tired. That's a reality. But I pray, Holy Spirit, would you infuse us with passion and energy again. God, speak to us. How do some of us get back on that train, so to speak? How do we plug ourselves back in? Back into you. Father, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's, let's stand. We're going to finish with just declaring this morning the goodness of God.